Imagine a world where you don't have immediate access to music. Imagine one where recordings of music, or recordings of any sounds for that matter, didn't even exist. This was the world before one very important invention, the phonograph. Hello and welcome to Music Theories, where we explain and analyze all topics related to music. Be sure to subscribe for more content, especially if you're a music geek like me. It's likely that you've heard of a man named Thomas Edison. He is known as one of America's most important inventors. Edison is credited with contributing to the technological development of the telegraph, motion picture camera, the alkaline storage battery, and the light bulb. He was also the founder of the utility later known as General Electric. But today we're focusing on only one of his accomplishments, the phonograph. In 1877, Thomas Edison designed a machine that would not only record the vibrations of sound waves, but also play them back. These wave indentations were recorded on metal cylinders, initially wrapped in paraffin paper, but later exchanged for tinfoil. This invention was highly original. Edison filed a patent in 1877 that was granted in 1878. The Edison Speaking Phonograph Company was then established as a means to produce and market these machines. In an interview with the North American Review in 1878, Thomas Edison breaks down the potential uses of the phonograph, including letter writing and all kinds of dictation, phonographic books, reproduction of music, the family record, a registry of sayings, memories, and last words, and educational purposes, so students didn't have to recall lessons by memory alone. Shortly after making this statement, Edison made a prediction that the phonograph will undoubtedly be liberally devoted to music, a prediction which, as we now know, turned out to be very true. Edison received $10,000 for the manufacturing and sales rights, as well as 20% of the profits. This machine was instantly triumphant in the world of innovation, but there were a few major setbacks. The machine was complicated when it came to operation and essentially required an expert. Additionally, the tinfoil was not very durable and would wear out after only a few playings. While the phonograph in its early stages is not the best in sound recording, its innovation and its flaws paved the way for an entirely new industry of entertainment. There is no doubt that Edison was ambitious, maybe too much so. The novelty of his invention wore off when he shifted all of his attention to the incandescent light bulb. In the meantime, Alexander Graham Bell, with the money he was awarded from the invention of the telephone, employed his cousin, Chichester A. Bell, and Charles Sumner Tainter to invent a better sound recording machine. It was called the graphophone. The primary difference between the two was that the graphophone used wax in place of tinfoil, and the needle was a floating stylus that engraved rather than indented. This created a more accurate reading of the waves. They were granted their own patent in 1886. Bell and Tainter actually approached Edison in hopes of consulting him about a collaboration, but Edison, known for his inflated ego and fierce competitiveness, refused. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., another inventor, Emil Berliner, who also contributed to the invention of the microphone, had concluded that the wax cylinder model was subject to wearing out, that the recording technology was in need of something more stable and a bit more permanent. As a result, he developed his own improved version of the phonograph, called the gramophone, which employed the use of flat discs instead of cylinders. You may recognize the gramophone, as it later serves as the inspiration for the highly acclaimed Grammy Award. Thus began the tiresome and expensive strife between Edison's phonograph companies and various competitors. Over the years, many versions of the phonograph were developed and released for renting and purchasing for various purposes. Entrepreneurs created a coin and slot machine that could be found in city streets. At these machines, people could listen to songs, jokes, and monologues that they previously did not have access to outside of live performances. These were a huge success until sound machines were made available for personal home use. The cylinders were improved and extended from two minutes to four minutes, and eventually the flat disc was curated. The first to offer this alternative was the Victor Talking Machine Company, one of Edison's biggest rivals. This invention created an entirely new market, record sales. This new trend of the 1920s was sort of short-lived, given the broadcasting of free music on the radio. But that didn't cease the influence of the phonograph or the market of record sales. This innovation in recording technology created a ripple effect that would continue for decades. 1925 was the first year electrical recordings were licensed and produced by both Victor and Columbia. These recordings, which allowed a much wider range of frequencies, opened the door for higher quality records and eventually for stereophonic sound. This is opposed to monophonic sound, which is one channel of audio. Think of this as a song being recorded by one microphone. 
Stereo sound is the application of two or more audio channels being recorded at once, which gives recordings a more realistic sound. Imagine a song being recorded with a mic on the right and a mic on the left. The Walt Disney Company was the first to use stereo sound in Fantasia in 1940, but the playback equipment proved to be very expensive to install. So stereo sound didn't make a comeback until the 1950s, when the multitude of options proved to be very inconvenient for buyers and sellers. Not everyone had a stereo player, so record companies had to produce both mono and stereo versions of records. Eventually, stereo became the standard. Magnetic tape and eventually multi-track recordings allowed for an even more realistic listening experience, while the invention of the LP record allowed for longer audio recordings. And from there, we know the rest. Recording quality gets better with cassette tapes and eventually compact discs. Music players get cheaper and more compact, such as the handheld radio, the Duo Junior, and the Walkman. If you'd like me to do a more in-depth history of these staples in music recording technology, let me know in the comments. There's no doubt that the phonograph essentially created the desire to have music at home and on demand. It created the desire for the instant replay, which was not a luxury that the everyday person had even thought of. The effects of the phonograph have been thoroughly examined by many music scholars and enthusiasts, including Mark Katz of the University of North Carolina. He claims that the phonograph changed music in two very significant ways. First, it changed the way music was played. In terms of recording, early recordings were just, well, terrible. Amazing, but terrible nonetheless. Microphones were not yet in use, so the recording process looked something like this. All musicians crowded into a room and played into one huge horn. This horn alone would be responsible for picking up all of the sound waves in the room, which it didn't. Most high and low end waves didn't come through at all. Mid-range waves didn't sound great either. The frequencies of violins and female voices were notoriously inaccurate. <laughs> Musicians resorted to getting creative and using things that sounded a bit better in recordings, like cowbells and woodblocks instead of drums. The success of Enrico Caruso's recordings is said to be an effect of this technology, as his tenor voice was said to be perfect for acoustic recording. The process was exhausting as well. Anything that was quiet dynamically had to be recorded very close to the horn, meaning multiple instruments had to pack in tightly to record. Everything loud or high-pitched had to be far from the horn or the needle would jump out of the groove. Rob Scallon has videos where he and his band record on various types of technology, including the wax cylinder. I'll link those videos in the description, they're super interesting and I highly recommend them. It differed from live performances because there was no room for error. This demanded a more disciplined type of musician and a new level of skill. The process of learning music changed as well. Musicians had music at their fingertips in a way that differed from sheet music. They could study through listening repeatedly rather than just reading. Where style and technique were concerned, they were once an effect of geographical region, but soon became an effect of choosing and learning from one's favorite recordings. Musicians could not only study the recordings of their favorite players, but they could record and evaluate their own playing. This proved to be highly influential in the development of jazz, but Katz also suggests that it might have changed the way classical players approached rhythm entirely. Additionally, limitations in recording technology sculpted the length and arrangements of songs throughout the decades. Composers and musicians would write and play to compensate for the shortcomings of recording technology. Figures such as Igor Stravinsky specifically wrote pieces with records time constraints in mind. The three to four minute pop song standard of today comes from the original 45 RPM record. This effect didn't stop in the mid-century. The turntable itself became an instrument in the 1970s when DJs like Grand Wizard Theodore, Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, and Africa Bombata would scratch records to make entirely new sounds and beats. The record player was essential in creating the genre that we know and love, hip hop. Second, it changed the way people listened to music. Prior to home listening, music was largely a social event. There was a time and a place for music listening, and it was not something you did alone. But suddenly, music became portable and was available at any time of day. 
Many commented on how odd it was to imagine someone listening to music at breakfast time, or worse, listening to music at home by themselves. That would have indicated that they were certifiably insane, apparently. Another significant change was the lack of a visual piece in music. It was suddenly completely auditory. And people were quite frankly freaking out. Where are they supposed to look while they listen? At the rotating disc? John Philip Sousa was a person that was particularly vocal about his rejection of this new culture. He claimed that recordings cheapened music, that they were a substitute for human skill, intelligence, and soul. Sounds familiar. Katz cites a situation from 1925 in which one music critic saw violinist Jesha Heifetz play live and called the performance cold, calm, and dispassionate. Yet when this same critic listened to Heifetz on a recording, he called it passionate and tender. But ultimately, the idea of instant replay also changed music in a huge way. This meant that a song was cemented in time. Every time it's played, it sounds exactly the same. The ear becomes very familiar with the recording and all of its imperfections, so audience members wanted to hear what they were familiar with. Where music recordings were once intended to match the live performances as accurately as possible, live performances are now intended to match the record as accurately as possible. Many feel a particular way about the loss of expression in this standard of performing. But perhaps the most important contribution to music in regards to the phonograph was the exposure to more music. Prior to the phonograph, you would only hear music if it was performed locally, otherwise it was unavailable. This broke barriers between Europe and America, the city and the countryside, and race. People could sneak records that were socially unacceptable and listen at home. White America had access to authentic black culture through jazz and blues records. This played a role in the healing of race relations in the U.S. We know that advances in recording technology continued throughout the 20th century, all of them proving to be largely significant, but none could be so significant as the one that launched music as an industry, the initial sound recording machine, the phonograph. I hope you all enjoyed, and I'd love to know some of your thoughts in the comments. Subscribe for more music history and analysis content, and let me know if there's any topic you'd specifically like to know about. Thanks for watching.